There are a lot of, I think, really uh, extraordinary things already going on uh, in the high Middle Ages that are preparing the way for the Renaissance. In terms of chivalric culture, the idea of uh, the, the knight in shining armor, the, 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 the man on a horse coming to save the imperiled heroine, the transformation of the castle sort of as this walled utopia that had defense as one of its, as one of its main, uh, main purposes, to that shift towards the palace, which again is a very cloistered, enclosed environment, this creation of a little tiny paradise, a little utopia within the walls, not really designed for defense. But the same thing very much happens as castles uh, transform into living places for the nobility and become cushier environments. But the same thing that informed the castle from the very beginning, and that is that enclosed, controlled environment that is anything from a safe place almost to a fantasy world that is controlled by those who control the castle or the palace. So courtly love poetry um, appropriates this architecture and appropriates the fusion of these two cultures. But what you see there is that notion that the knight must undergo a number of struggles in order to reach the ultimate goal. And that is the nature of the quest. So the quest is what prepares the knight. You have this absolutely integrated Christian self, um, and it's, um, it was there first, and Christianity had sort of done that organizing, mobilizing work. But, but it's produced a certain kind of self in the High Middle Ages. Um, and I would say by the 12th century, we see uh, interesting new variations. Uh, this, this self is starting to invest itself in other worldly, secular things. Not the heavenly afterlife, but things like love, things like fame possibly for the first time see uh, a complete investment in perishable goods, so to speak, uh, because that's what love is about. Love is about loving someone who is not going to live forever. If you're able to appreciate sort of the color and variation and dynamism that's already there uh, in the 12th and 13th centuries, um, then What's going on in the Renaissance is going to be striking. Italy is, Italy is ahead of the rest of Europe in, in, in many respects. Just how competitive this, this, uh, this situation is in Italy and that that competition is, is one which is carried out on battlefields, but it's a, it's a competition that's also carried out in the arts. When you look at a Da Vinci, Brunelleschi, uh, when you look at some of the engineering accomplishments and some of the scientific accomplishments, you're tempted to say you're getting close to something. By virtue of sort of living among the sort of the, uh, the relics uh, of antiquity, Brunelleschi, you know, when, he's, when he's trying to come up with a, with a solution for, uh, for the Duomo in, in, in Florence, is, is, is studying the uh, Pantheon. Uh, among other things, he's right there, where he can where he can observe uh, the great cultural achievements of antiquity. Leading up to a Galileo, uh, you have someone like Da Vinci, who who is maybe the best example of the Renaissance man. You know, we talked about the Renaissance person. Mastering the arts, the touches that, that you have to master to be one of the one of the world elite painters. At the same time, I think it was known if you need a creative solution, maybe for solving a particular uh, issue or something, go talk to Leonardo. You know, go bring him out and show him, and, and maybe he maybe he can give you some ideas about what you know how you might how you might solve the problem. Dante's the Summa Poeta. I think in many respects rep represents the culmination of medieval developments and maybe already sort of tipping over into, into something very new and different. So when we look at Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy, it appropriates this entire tradition of the chivalric romance, of the religious struggle, of the, the struggle through hardship, martyrdom, pilgrimage, all of those preparatory exercises that allow the knight, uh, the pilgrim, to descend into hell, 
to suffer in order to ascend to meet his lady. This is what Dante does. He descends into the inferno. He then turns around and has this arduous struggle up Mount Purgatory where his sins are purged, where he's purified. And ultimately then runs into, encounters Beatrice, she who blesses. And then she takes him in hand and takes him to paradise. There's a move towards grounding poetry in real things, in real people. Dante's love. She'll take on a, a heavenly significance alongside the Almighty in paradise. But she was once mortal, an individual, so to speak, an individual with, with individual characteristics, and and that and that an individual can be sort of transfigured this way in poetry is an innovation. The Vita Nuova, the context of it, of course, is Florence which is not part of a courtly culture. Uh, it is a republic. Uh, it does not have a nobility where people are born to the castle. There isn't a high table. Uh, so how does one become noble? Yet Dante and his fellow poets in the 1200s uh, were well schooled in the uh, courtly poetry. It had come in from France, it had come in through Sicily. They were aware of it. It sounded like a really awesome idea. Right? Wow, I can become noble if I sing my praises to a lady uh, that I'm not even allowed to touch. And even in the Vita Nuova, you start to see this transformation where Dante starts to see his beloved as actually part and parcel of the heavenly court. And so Dante sees that in many ways how he can get to heaven is, is by this new kind of poetry not just the one that the, he and his, his fellow cohorts are practicing where they liken their ladies to an angel, but where they recognize that love is actually, uh, as St. Paul had said, it's the essence of God. The Medici, I, I think, are examples both of, of, of great competitors during this period of time. Uh, they're kind of in the middle of a lot of the important, important developments. They're basically bankers. They rise to power and, you know, competing, uh, but competing carefully. And competition is, uh, is a tricky thing, you know. You, uh, you're competing with, with competitors on, with whom you want to try to remain on relatively good terms. They understand the political importance of art in Renaissance Italy and of, of having the best artists and surrounding themselves with beautiful things. And, and this uh, accompanies their ascendancy, sort of this sort of understanding of the value of art that goes beyond the purely artistic and sort of goes on to the level of, of, of the political. And that means having to understand kind of what's important, uh, where to where to invest their time, how how quickly do they want to make an impression, how big of an impression do they want to make. Uh, uh, you don't want to overdo it um, and make people jealous and envious and, and, and possibly want to uh, stab you in the back at some point in time. Um, sooner or later, they're going to want to do that anyway. You know. With Machiavelli, you have this sort of domain of chance opening up, and the idea that to be a good prince, prince the prince has to master, be a master of chance. And, well, it's in the nature of chance that you master it sometimes, and you fail to do so sometimes, okay? He believes that if you base yourself on experience, that you'll perhaps help to uh, sort of move the odds in your favor a little bit. I think that's what's new uh, about uh, Machiavelli's text and what's, what's, what's individual about, about his text. Uh, Machiavelli genders fortune as, you know, it's, it's lady fortune, and lady fortune is, is kind of this fickle female creature uh, who's, who's, who's wrecking people's lives here and and who's favoring people here, and who knows why, you know, who can understand why. Uh, but the, the knowledgeable prince is the one who is in a position to sort of 
uh, let's say, master her. As we move into the early modern period, uh, the stage, so to speak, of cultural activity or action is getting larger in some, in some respects in cities. Palaces are, are, tend to be much bigger, not, not as big as cities, but um, much, as mu much larger than, than the medieval castles, for example. We transition from uh, Renaissance Italy to sort of Reformation Germany. We're interested in Italy and we remain interested in Europe. We're interested in Germany, we remain interested in Europe too. The thing that really kind of starts to shake things up clearly is the Reformation. During periods of time, the city is going to be sort of moving ahead, but the development, sort of the development towards the modern city becomes much more herky-jerky. Cities really will be, as we know, the places where culturally things will happen that shape, that shape the world that we are familiar with. Architecturally, we still create the palace, and we still create the castle when we want to be the princess being, uh, being rescued. Uh, when we want to challenge the knight, we still send him out, whether it's out onto a football field, right, to get his helmet on and do battle against the forces of evil, Florida State, or <laughs> we, 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 we battle try him. Right? But when you really, really, really want to study, you want to get away from it all, you go into the library, you withdraw into the monastery, you go into the cloister, you shut off all the outside distractions and you go into the garden. So in many ways, the past is always present. But we have to move through a lot of turbulent history before we can reach these sort of large, uh, extremely large, powerful um, cities that are, that are full of uh, vibrant sort of culture again. On and off in the 16th and 17th centuries, you have, at least in the center of Europe, this confessional strife more or less extreme forms. Cities were destroyed. Uh, uh, the Thirty Years War period in particular, not a good time for the development of cities in, in, in the German states. What's important during this period of time is defining the, the right way to be a Christian. You know, Luther uh, not, doesn't really want to change the world. Uh, he doesn't want to be a revolutionary. He just wants to kind of streamline, and this is the word I use, and I hope that doesn't seem to be too irreverent, but he wants to return to the roots. He wants a Pauline, Augustine sort of version of Christianity uh, based on uh, love of God and neighbor and based on, uh, based on faith. And he jettisons works. Uh, works done to achieve salvation, those are jettisoned. The works that one is now freely going to do and should do uh, because one is filled with the Spirit of God. Obviously, those are works that you're going to do and, and freely do and, and can't help but do if you're the, the right kind of Christian that, that Luther thinks that you should be. He promotes the idea of the individual in individualizing the relationship of the Christian to God and in making the Bible the only instrument that's necessary for salvation. The believing Christian with the Bible, that's all you need. And he's saying basically that Rome has become Babylon, speaking of cities. Basically that nothing that Rome has come up with is of any value to us. Well, you can imagine the consequences. It's like the values of things have to be defined. Rome has no value anymore. Not only does it not have any value, if it's Babylon, it has kind of negative value. Because the power of religious authority has been compromised as these confessions have gone at each other and attacked each other's legitimacy, who fills the void? Who is, who, where's the leadership of the future, so to speak? Um, and it's the princes. And the princes build the, the cathedrals of the early modern period, and that's these, these, these palaces where they, where they hope to do the same thing that medieval people and the medieval church once hoped to accomplish with, with the cathedrals architecturally, and that is 
to overwhelm, to impress, to, to show the power. This is the way that the individual now is being, let's say, authorized by Luther, authorized in the sense of being given sort of the authority, that same authority that used to be so grandiose in the Middle Ages, emperor, pope, etc. Put it inside and you have the individual Christian as king. It's hard to, to think of ourselves as medieval people, but Umberto Eco said that we're still in the Middle Ages. We just have different things.